two, one. There we are. All right. Thanks, Art. All right. Good to, uh, again, welcome you here uh, in the auditorium and those of you joining us online. Uh, so you know, I just told you to turn to Second Peter 897, if you're using a pew Bible, page 800. And 97. We're going back to our study of Second Peter. We were away from it a little while during the uh, the holidays, and uh, it's been a while. It's been seven weeks, as a matter of fact. So we're gonna we're gonna do a little uh, review uh, just to get us back up to up to speed, get our mind working back on that. If you were to read, uh, you, you'll notice maybe turn the page, and there's three chapters in the book of Second Peter. So it's a a short book. If you were to read it thoughtfully. Two or three or four times, you'd see that the first chapter is about spiritual growth, and the second chapter is about false prophets, and the third chapter is about the return of Christ. And you really can't miss those things if you're thinking about it while you're uh, you're reading. And so, uh, based on that, uh, I've presented to you this theme that uh, theme of Second Peter is something like this: pursue spiritual growth to protect yourself against false teachers and to be prepared for the return of Christ. And uh, I gave the title of the series, Second Peter in Three Words, Working, Warning, and Watching. And I, I want to start again with uh, looking at verse number one. It's, it's, I'm going to warn you, um, since it's been two months, and, uh, and since the first part of the book when when Peter opens the book he he shares certain things that are throughout the book and so it's important that we really get that so I'm going to do a longer than normal review uh, just to get us up to up to speed verse number one we know that this letter book is written to believers it is to people who have obtained like precious faith it is those that have saving faith. Uh, we have obtained like precious faith. Salvation, saving faith, is a gift. Uh, we know, most of us know, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And so Peter is writing to people like himself that have received Christ. They have received saving faith. And we see in verse 1, the end of verse 1, how we get saving faith. It is through the righteousness of God. Through the righteousness of God. What is the righteousness of God? Why? Well, I shared with you before righteousness. I like to think in my mind rightness. Rightness with God. That's a We don't use the word righteous a lot. We understand rightness. Uh, and it is those we have obtained faith through rightness with God. Our sin makes us not right with God. Our sin disqualifies us from heaven. And so in order to be qualified for heaven, uh, we need to have rightness with God. And God has a way for us to be right with him. And people have a way that they think they become right with him. They do all kinds of things. The Bible calls it works. Uh, they get baptized as a baby. They think, I mean, they really have to take someone's word for it. I guess I was baptized as an infant, but I have to take a piece of paper's word for it because I certainly don't remember. But So they get baptized as an infant, and then they get catechized, and then they join a church, and then they give money, and they try to keep the golden rule, and they read their Bibles, and they say prayers. Uh, there's a difference between praying and saying prayers, right? And they, they try to treat people they want to, the way they want to be treated. They do all these things in hopes that their good things, their good deeds will make them acceptable to God. But we are warned that self-righteousness does not give us salvation. Self-righteousness does not give us saving faith. Uh, they, I, I have on your outline there, uh, Romans 10, 3. 
people who try to make themselves right with God are, according to Romans 10.3, ignorant of God's righteousness, God's way to be right. They're ignorant of God's way. They go about to establish their own righteousness and they have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God, unto God's way to being righteous. Again, simply put, God has a way for people to become right with him, and people have a way that they think gets them right with him. And the Bible warns us, I gave you Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And Jesus warned in Matthew 7 that the gate to destruction is wide. It is broad. Many there be which go in thereat. Wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. I think sometimes we take lightly the fact that most people are going the wrong way. You, you can't read Matthew 7, 13 any, way, any different. Jesus said broad is the gate that leads to destruction. And so we need to look at people as most people are going the wrong way. They are trying to establish their own righteousness. And God's way to be righteous, I have Romans 10, 14, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes it. That doesn't mean Christ got rid of the law. That means Christ perfectly fulfilled the law. He completed the law. And that means because he had a perfect life, he could die as our substitute. And not only could he die as our substitute, he did die as our substitute. But does that mean everyone's going to heaven? No. Uh, it says to everyone that believeth, we personally need to submit ourselves to the righteousness of God. We personally need to understand our need for forgiveness and understand that Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay our penalty. And we need to come to God in repentance and faith. And receive Christ. God, Christ is God's gift to us, and we need him. And when we do that, God not only, and this is the, the great exchange, not only does God count our sin as being on Christ, he counts Christ's perfectness as belonging to us. It, it, God, Christ's perfectness is credited to our account. And so that people who were formally disqualified because of their sin are now qualified for heaven. And Peter is writing to those people, that group of people. Is that you? Does that describe you? Have you submitted yourselves to God's way to be right with him? That's the most important thing. God has a way for us to be right with him. It is the only way to be right with him. And each person has to submit to that way themselves. And so this book is to believers. It is to people who have done that. They have received Christ. They are born again, blood bought, heaven bound children of God. In verse 2, Peter's heartbeat, and really, God's heartbeat. Let's not forget, Peter knew somehow that he was going to be leaving earth soon. So this was his farewell address. And his farewell address is, I want grace and peace to be multiplied to you. We talked about this before, but grace and peace are things that God gives we, Peter says, I want grace and peace, gifts from God to be multiplied unto you. God has to give them, but we have a part in God giving, pouring those out on us, giving those gifts to us. It is through the knowledge, verse 2, of Jesus Christ. Knowledge is not just learning. 
in your head things about God. We need to have a relationship with God. And I'm going to uh, expand on that a little bit more. Verse 3, Peter reminds us that God has given us everything we need for life, meaning eternal life and godliness. God has provided what you need to be saved and what you need to live a godly life. God has provided that through his divine power. But even though we have eternal life, and even though God has provided everything, we need to know and claim the great and precious promises. We need to incorporate those things into our life. They don't happen automatically. You look at people you know that claim to be a Christian. You look at your own life, and you look at times of growth and times of drift. You look at other people, the same thing. God, we, we have a responsibility. Verse 5, beside this, giving all diligence, God says, I want you, if you're going to grow, you need to add these things. And remember, add is not just sprinkle a little bit like salt you put in your on your dinner plate. Uh, it is lavishly, abundantly supply. Work diligently at adding virtue, which is excellence or moral uprightness, uh, knowledge, applying scripture to your life. Uh, we are to add temperance, which means self-control, patience, which means perseverance, godliness, a respect and reverence for God, brotherly kindness, a care for those that are believers, and charity or love, which is a love for others. Outside of faith, love our enemies. And then we see that if we do those things, in verse 8, God gives us some promises. Here's what's going to happen. If you do these things, verse 8, if these things be in you and they abound, then this happens. But before we look at the benefits and the promises, number one on your outline, there are prerequisites. There are things that we need to do. What is it that we need to do? Verse 8, for if these things be in you and abound. What things? The things that Peter just talked about. We need to have those spiritual qualities in our life. We're lavishly to supply them. We're supposed to add these things, and they are not supposed to just be in us. They are supposed to abound. And Peter, I think, really make sure we get this. Verse 5, giving all diligence. Verse 8, for if these things be in you and abound. Verse 10, wherefore the rather brethren give diligence. We are cannot, we, we absolutely have to understand that God wants us to work on spiritual growth. We cannot, we dare not sit in the canoe and do nothing and let the river of life take us wherever it's going to take us. We can't do that. And Peter, and I keep saying Peter, it's God. God emphasizes you need to not be lazy and do nothing. We, God wants us to work, not to get to heaven, work because we're going to heaven and because our Christian life, we, we won't grow on autopilot. We will drift on autopilot because we're sinful. And so we need to work on it. God wants his children to work on growing spiritually. Number two, number two on your outline. God's promises to those who diligently pursue spiritual growth. What happens when we put these qualities of verses 5 through 7, what happens when we make them a priority and we work diligently on them? What are the, what are the benefits? What are the blessings? Letter A, verse number 8, I'm going to read that again. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So letter A, we will not have a barren, ineffective relationship with Christ. I'm, I'm sticking with it's presented negatively, negatively. We will not be barren. When we hear the word barren, we think of, sometimes in the Bible, we think of 
a particular woman who didn't have a baby for a long time, so they were barren. Uh, we think of a tree not giving fruit, so it's barren. Uh, but barren doesn't mean unfruitful in this case, because if it does, then unfruitful is said twice. Barren, you're un neither will you be unfruitful or, or unfruitful. Well, uh, it doesn't make sense. So un barren has a couple of different meanings. Uh, one is idle, like unemployed. Sorry, Dave. Um, idle, uh, you know... It also says lazy. I'm not saying that. But it's, it's so it, barren doesn't just mean doesn't produce something. It can mean idle or unemployed. Like Jesus used it in the parable when he went to hire workers. Why stand ye idle? Why are you unproductive? Why aren't you employed? Uh, Jesus uses the word there, but it's also used in James 2.20. And I gave you that verse on your outline. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead. That's the word barren. It's dead. Faith without works is ineffective. It is useless. It is unprofitable. And I think that's the meaning that we have, that Peter is saying here. If you throw yourself into growing spiritually, your relationship with God will not be useless and ineffective. It will matter. It will be useful. So what does an effective, what does a useful relationship with God look like? Here's an illustration that, that I think will help. To the best of my knowledge, and I've shared this with you before, to the best of my knowledge, my biological father, if he's still alive, lives in California. Okay? Uh, I my, my relationship with him is based solely on sharing DNA. I do not have his phone number. I do not have his address. I would not call him to chit-chat. I would not call him for advice. Uh, I would not, if I was in help financially, uh, spiritually, I, I would not. We are basically strangers. We have a relationship by blood, but there is the, the, the relationship does not benefit either one of us. We are like strangers. I last saw him 38 years ago at my grandparents' 50th uh, wedding anniversary, and I, I probably will not see him again. Uh, that's just the nature of the relationship. That, I think you'd agree, is an ineffective, unhelpful, uh, non-beneficial relationship. We're basically strangers. So I'm not going to embarrass them, but I'm going to embarrass them. Contrast that with the father-son relationship that Art and Don have. They see each other every day. They talk to one another every day. They share meals together every day. They look out for one another's health. They fix things together and fish together and serve the Lord together and work together. They read the Bible together. They pray together. They share advice with one another. I think they, I hate to say this, I think they fight less than my wife and I. I don't, I, I just, I just never, I, I, my wife's like mortified I just said that. But I've never seen them disagree. I, I don't even know how that's possible. They never disagree. The point is this. That is a helpful, effective, beneficial relationship for both of them. And so I want to ask you, how is your relationship with God. God wants to have that kind of father-son relationship. God wants to have that. So how? what characterizes your relationship with God? Name only, zero impact, doesn't affect your daily living, like me and my biological father, or one that is communes with friend as friend, like 
uh, Fanny Crosby wrote and sang about. If you work at, God's promise is this, if you work at putting into your life these spiritual qualities that Peter gives us in verses 5 through 7, you will have that close relationship with God. It will not be barren. It will not be ineffective. It will be useful. It will be beneficial. It will be helpful to you. So promise number one, we will not have an ineffective relationship with Christ. Letter B, promise number two, we will not have an unfruitful relationship. So it's different. We say that again in verse number eight. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful. So unfruitful here is what we think of when we hear unfruitful, not bearing fruit. The fruit, of course, is not talking about apples and oranges, not talking about physical fruit. It's talking about spiritual fruit. And it shouldn't be surprising that if we work on spiritual qualities, we should bear spiritual fruit, right? They, they just kind of, it, it goes hand in hand. And I think as we bear, well, I don't think, I know, as we bear spiritual fruit, as we work on spiritual things, we bear spiritual fruit and people will see that. And I think that's kind of the distinction Peter is making here. Uh, you will have an effective relationship with God yourself, but it will also be a relationship with God that bears fruit and affects others. It will impact others. And so what about you? Have those that are close to you seen a difference in your life since you've trusted Christ? Is your life different? Is your life different? It should be. There should be fruit there. Fruit is should be manifest. We should have, the God wants us to have the fruit of the Spirit. We should be characterized by things, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. We should be characterized by things that is very different from what the world is characterized by. So if we don't have an effective relationship with God, and if we don't have a fruitful relationship with God, it's because we are not, I mean, that's God's promise. If you wholeheartedly throw yourself into spiritual growth, growth, you will have this kind of relationship with God. It will be effective for you. It will be beneficial and fruitful to others. But what if we don't do that? What if we disobey this command and we don't work hard at it? What happens besides having an ineffective and unfruitful relationship. Well, number three on your outline, we have God's pronouncements. God's pronouncements against those who fail to pursue spiritual growth. God's pronouncements. Verse number nine. But he that lacketh these things is blind. They are blind. What does it mean to be blind? Well, Peter is obviously speaking in spiritual terms, but he uses a physical handicap for us to understand a spiritual thing. And obviously, we could go a lot of different directions on this, but I think you'd agree this. People that are blind fail to see beauty, and they fail to see danger. Would you agree? People that are blind can't see the beauty in the world around them, and they can't see the danger in the world around them. Think of that spiritually. If you are blind spiritually, if, if you lack these things, if you are not pursuing spiritual growth, you don't see God working in your life. You don't see, you don't, you don't recognize the goodness of God in your daily life, in the mercy that he gives you, and the good things that he does. You don't see it. You also don't see the danger that you're in. You drift and you drift and you drift and you don't see the danger and you're going to fall and you fall often and you fall hard. That is, and, and notice 
It doesn't say, you will become blind. It says, you're already blind. You are already blind. We have to get this. If we don't work on growing spiritually, God says to us, you're blind. If we neglect spiritual growth, you are blind right now. Letter B, not only are they blind, letter B, they are short-sighted. They are short-sighted. Now, if you're thinking, you might be saying, okay, wait a minute. Of course, how can a person be short-sighted when they're blind? If they're blind, they can't see. Of course they can't see. They can't see far or near. They, how does that work? Well, it can't happen physically, but it can happen spiritually. We can be both blind and short-sighted spiritually. In fact, I think the two go hand in hand. And, and here's what I mean. If you are blind to what is important, you will only pursue the present, the here and now. If you're blind about what's important, you will only be about here and now. If you're only involved about here and now, you're short-sighted. You're not thinking about eternity. And so the two go hand in hand. Can't see afar off because you're blind to what's important. We need to have an eternal perspective. Jesus tells us what happens if we get caught up in the here and now. Mark 4.19, the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the other things entering, other things entering and choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. We focus on here and now and the cares of this life and don't think about eternity. We are short-sighted and we are short-sighted because we are blind to what is important. So if we don't pursue these things, we are blind, we are short-sighted, and letter C, God also says we are forgetful. End of verse 9. I'll read the whole verse, verse 9. But he that lacks these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his own sins. They are forgetful. And we, we again have the reminder, Peter is not talking about, he's not talking to people and telling them, you got to work, 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 so you get to heaven. He's saying, your sins were purged. You're already, you are a believer. The Bible never says an unbeliever has their sins purged. And verse 10, he calls them brethren. The Bible does not call unsaved people brethren. I should actually just clarify that because the rich man in hell wanted his brethren warned, didn't he? And he was not talking about believers. But by and large, when God uses the word brethren, He's referring to believers. And so Jesus is saying, or, or Peter, God through Peter is saying, a believer can forget that they have been purged or they have been cleansed from their sins. How can a true believer forget that they have been forgiven? Do they, do they really develop amnesia and no longer have the ability to recall what happened? I don't think that's what Peter's saying. I think it's, they don't have, it's not that they don't have the ability to recall, it's they no longer appreciate the fact that they have been forgiven. I'm not going to have you turn there, but Ezekiel chapter 16, gives a very heart-touching picture of how God, God used an illustration of a baby to, to show how he called a nation. And the picture of this baby, it's a newborn baby girl that is literally thrown out into a field to die. And God walks by and picks up the baby 
and cleans up the baby and clothes the baby and feeds the baby. But he does more than that. He literally treats the baby like a princess. She is given fine linen and silk to wear. She's given necklaces and earrings. It's all in Ezekiel 16. Necklaces and earrings and bracelets and a crown. She is literally treated as a princess. That's a picture of what God does for us. We are helpless, just like a baby in a field that has nothing but death to look forward to. We are helpless. We are hopeless. We have no way to get out of our sin. We have no way to become forgiven unless God in his mercy extends help to us. And he did that, didn't he? Through Christ. Christ is our mercy. He is our gift. And so God extends Christ to us. And when we receive Christ, we are forgiven. It's just like we're picked up and washed off and our sins have been removed as far as the east is from the west. And he does the same thing. He doesn't make us a princess, but he does make us a child of the king, right? We're a child of the king. But sadly, we sometimes do what this grown-up baby turned princess did. What was that? Instead of staying true to the one who loved her and did so much for her, she, the late nation of Israel, left him and pursued other lovers, the Bible says. And I gave you Ezekiel 16.22. God says to her, to this one whom he had done so much, and in all thine abominations and thy whoredoms, thou hast not remembered the days of thy youth, when thou wast naked and bare and was polluted in thy blood. What about us? Can we take for granted, can we underappreciate what God has done for us. Yes, we can. That's why we have songs like Lead Me to Calvary. We didn't sing that here this morning, but here's the refrain. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thine love for me, lead me to Calvary. That's why Jesus wants us, when we take the Lord's Supper, it is this do in remembrance. Of me, And that's why God warns us here in 2 Peter 1 verse 9 that if we fail to pursue spiritual growth, we have forgotten. We are not appreciating that we have been cleansed. Uh, Thomas Schreiner, I think I gave you this quote, wrote this. Those who treasure being forgiven live in a way that pleases God. That's good, isn't it? That's a, that's a good thing. That, that's a truth that we ought to remind ourselves. Those who treasure being forgiven live in a way that pleases God. What about you? Are you living in a way that pleases God? Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, your word. Uh, we thank you that this is your word to us. Uh, Lord, we, we sense the urgency in your word f- through Peter. Uh, that you want us to grow. You want us to grow spiritually. You've given us everything we need, and yet growth is a cooperative effort with you. And this chapter uh, reminds us of that over and over again. And Lord, this is quite a reminder. If we don't do that, that, if we lack these things, we are right now, blind, and we are right now short-sighted, and we are right now living as if we have forgotten that we have been forgiven. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would work in our hearts, stir our hearts afresh just to think about the wondrous gift of forgiveness that we have, uh, that we would 
want to pursue a close relationship with you because of what you have done for us. And Lord, again, I just ask that you would work in, in each of our hearts. You know where we're at with you. Uh, help us to respond the way you desire, and I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So what would God have us do? I don't know all your birthdays. I don't know all your middle names. But we're all in one of two groups, aren't we? We are trying to establish our own way to be right with God, or we have submitted to God's way to become right. And that's the most important decision. That's the most important thing we need to face is, have we submitted ourselves to God's way to be righteous? In other words, are you saved? Are you born again? That's the most important thing. I encourage you each week. I, I remind you of that. If you have questions about that, make sure you talk to me. Second, we need to be honest of how we evaluate our spiritual life. Are we growing? Are we growing? If we're growing, God says you will have that kind of close relationship with him. You will have a relationship with him that matters. Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting and sad how many Christians are Christians in name only. And they don't, they don't turn to God ever for anything. What kind of relationship is that? Are they really saved? But God wants us, the way to have a relationship with him, a close relationship, is to put these things into practice. We are going, God says, we're blind and we're short-sighted and we have forgotten if we neglect these things. So don't, don't get to the end of your life, which may be sooner than any of us realize. Don't get to the end of your life and say, I wish I had given him more. Give him all now. Give him everything now. I invite you to stand 441. I wish I had given him more. Our organist and pianist and song leader are going to come. 441, please stand if you can.